one of the things that struck me more intensely than ever watching it again was that it feels more uh, poetic. Uh, it feels more like a poem, a dreamscape. I don't know whether that's because it happens so much at night. There's so many sections in it. And it's unusual. You ha there, there are only seconds of films of yours that are at night. I think about um, Life is Sweet where he's coming out of the restaurant drunk or something like that. It's basically a, a daylight. Yeah, I mean, it is. Uh, uh, obviously, this film is a, a, a kind of um, nocturnal journey even when it isn't actually nocturnal when um we got to that stage because what we do with these films is um i go into a long period with the actors to get the thing on the go and discover what it is that we're d doing but there's always a, an agreed time where i have to we agree a date because we know we're going to start filming on a certain date, uh, where I'm, I'm committed to sit down with the cinematographer, and it was Dick Pope in this case, as it mostly has been, and the production designer, who was Alison Chitty, who of course is a great opera designer, and indeed the, the costume and makeup designers, uh, where, where I have to say, give some indication of what it is that we're, we're dealing with. And in this particular case, um, I, I said, well, what's emerging is it's a kind of solo nocturnal journey. It has, it has a darkness about it. Um, and so that gave Dick Pope and Alison Chitty a kind of clue. And the first thing he suggested was that we look at some films, including films like 1984 and, um, and um, Terence Davis's early films, where they'd used what's called bleach bypass, where you miss out part of the process in the laboratory and you get this kind of quality. Um, and we shot tests and uh, and it was in the production design and indeed the costume design it, that was reflected in the choices that were made. In fact, the um, I always send up Alison Chitty, um, who is, as I say, a consummate opera designer now, um, because in the scene in the um, Brian's office block. Uh, if you look very carefully, you will actually see a fire bell that's grey. Because she was so obsessive about there should be no reds anywhere that she painted this red fire bell grey. Well, of course, there are no grey fire bells anywhere in the world, basically. Um, but I, I say all that because the clue was the nocturnal bit, really. And although, of course, it's not all at night, uh, it, it's it's in a way part of the dark spirit of the of the piece at one level i say at one level because i'm cautious uh not to um make this a sort of reductionist analysis of the film because it's far more complex than yeah that. i think I, I i absolutely agree and i feel this one <clears throat> more th there's an elusiveness about this one structurally uh, all kinds of ways where where i mean i I know that you m mold the film in the same way that a potter might mold clay. It's the same kind of thing. So <clears throat> the idea that you have, for example, sat <clears throat> in a room saying, and then Johnny does this, and then Johnny does that, it, it really doesn't work like that. It's well, it, it, I mean, it doesn't and it does. I mean, the fact of the matter is, um, at a simple level, it is... A series of things that happen to Johnny, and that he does, and that you know, and to other people. I mean, and they are sequential, and uh, yeah, yeah, and consequential. I'll give um, you an example of what I mean, though. Um, the Jeremy character, Greg Cockwell's character, he's introduced Sebastian Jeremy. Sebastian Jeremy, he's introduced 
I mean, you could be forgiven if you've never seen the film before. Some of you may have not seen it before. Uh, randomly. You don't necessarily know why he's there. You see the guy pumping in the gym. You don't know who he is. You've not seen him before. You're meeting characters at this stage in the film. And then when you encounter him again, he seems to be meet. He's in a restaurant, I think. And he, we're meeting him with a character we haven't seen before. And he, it seems to be running a parallel track. That's fine, of course. But then, quite a way on into the film, he enters the space and you see him from behind. Well, you then discover what, why you've been why, looking at him. Yeah. But that's a thing that, I mean, I do that quite a lot here and there. I mean, we've talked quite a lot uh, about st my habit, often, not in this film, of starting with a character who turns out to have nothing, to, not, not, not to, to do the main with anything. thing. Yeah. Well, not to be the main action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, um, I think that's on, uh, on one level. I mean, that that's just in the or, the ordinary business of creating st storytelling. You know, I mean, you know, here is, I mean, secrets and lies starts with a, 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 a what's obviously the main focus is a young black woman at a black funeral, and then there's a wedding photographer photographing a, 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 a posh white girl and then in his house and then you see somebody else and, and but that's just storytelling and that's cinematic storytelling and that uh, obviously is what happens here but what we what we started talking about was the mood the spirit of this film and obviously apart from anything else when i embarked on this uh i there are all sorts of things on the go and preoccupations and uh, and objectives and, and uh, things to explore. But one of the things, as apart from anything else, was that I, having made a number of films that were, on the whole, you could call domestic, I just wanted to sort of get, get away from that, just, you know, being in the house with the family thing. Um and also to do a picaresque film about just somebody Episodes. going yeah. well, going from one experience to another and you know coming round and co going round in circles and coming back and all that stuff you know um but that's on one level you know so. i su i suppose it's the f one of the things i noticed is that the, the the house story takes just under half an hour. You you set it up right from that extraordinary pre credits beginning. It's very unusual for you to have a pre credits sequence, which is a night thing. It's brutal, and it sets the tone of the film. And there's this drum from Andrew Dixon's music, which is like Hellgate's opening, and you have the long drive and the credit sequence, and you're ready on a journey. So you set the idea of a journey up right from the very beginning of the film. And I gather that, that whole section was the last, was it the last thing to be shot? The it was shot later it. on. Yeah. But that's, but that's um, yeah, I, I don't think that matters. Um, In the sense that you always knew it was going to start up. Yeah, what, what, yeah, yes. Once you started getting the story together. Well, well yes, knew. yes. I mean, that's just the nature of filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. And he gets down, he comes in, you find him in front of the house and the film, the first scene with Sophie, and then he's in. And then he's in there, apart from just um, jumps to Jeremy Sebastian, and then he's out, that extraordinary sequence on with him moving like a, a trapped animal from the room to the room to the room, and then he's out. And that all takes place within half an hour. I was very surprised looking. I just watched that today and saw that it was very economical. It's as if you you didn't want to spend that much time. Well, I don't think that's necessarily. I mean, I, I hadn't. I don't don't know that I've ever thought about that particularly. I mean, it what happens there takes as long as it takes. takes yeah. You, you know? Oh, I didn't imply that you were a no, stopwatch. I was no. impressed by how quickly he actually gets out into the night world of yes, Soho. Yes, yes. It's interesting you say that because, in fact, I think the, I don't know what anyone who's just seen it f f feels, but. Um, I, I I think that the experience 
somehow should be that you feel he's been in you feel what he feels he he suddenly does feel trapped he's he's had enough of this and he just wants to get out there you know um so however long it may or short it may be it needs to have the a, a, a sense that it is just becoming claustrophobic for for a minute. Yeah. And 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 there's you know I mean he's you know he 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 um he doesn't really know how to behave properly with regards to Louise even though he's come to see her. But he's partly come to see her because that's who he knows in London. In London. Um and he certainly uh walks in a, in a way although it's his own of his own making to a great extent he walks into a kind of a a trap that he doesn't want to know about with um Sophie but um I, I don't really like analyzing what you've just seen because you've just seen it you know yeah but for, you know from my point of view I, to me I I see musical um structures uh and that is the first movement to me and then you have this extraordinary Soho section uh, and the the wandering around London and the kind of uh, it's presented almost like an inferno when he is under the bridges with um, Susan Fiddler's Maggie uh, and that's a whole other movement and then you have the movement with uh, uh, Peter White's character Brian, Brian. Yeah, Brian and then we go Back to the house. No, you have the woman in the window, which is extremely powerful and full of strange poetry with her tattoo and the map of Ireland, which is elusive and doesn't make a literal sense. And you can't. This is what I mean by poetic. Yes, Nothing yes. Is no, I think you know, it, it is. It is definable. in that sense different from um, some from well, any of my other films. In yeah, sense. yeah, it is definitely. No, no, no. But of course, what. I think that's true, and I don't want to dwell on that because sure. uh, it's just the we don't want to over-explain what you just said. Yeah. But I think part of I think what's important, certainly what was important in creating it, was and collaborating with David Thewlis on Johnny. I don't think the the what you call the poetic nature, uh, uh, the the fluidity of what happens in the film and the narrative, I don't think it would, I think it, it's, it's very much in harmony or in sync with Johnny's verbosity. Johnny, Johnny's, if you like, Johnny's own poetry. I mean, you might call it that. His own sense of language and his own um, riffs and his own stream of consciousness and all of that. Those things are working in harmony with each other, really. They're, they're, they're part of the same thing, really. I suppose I put it down to also that you're... Um, Mike is also a, a very good, very brilliant visual artist. You know, he draws and... Um, there's, a, there's a vivid set of images in Naked. Um, it's not that it's been absent in other films. It's just much more concentrated and much more pervasive. It's heightened. Um, and that's, what I, again, what I mean by poetic. Heightened. It's out of the everyday. I think any idea that... Because normally you would describe your films as um, in a realist tradition. But this isn't really. Well, no. I, I, it, it's, it's all the things it is that on the whole, the other films aren't. However, in the end, when the chips are down, I think it is realist in that it, at any given moment, it's real. I mean, there's no, um, yeah, he gets you, know, it, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, we should, uh, the only other thing I wanted to do before I opened it up is that um, we. it seems to have attained uh, a, a generally recognised classic status, I think. But at the time in this country, um, when it was released, it, it didn't do that. It wasn't that well received here. Everywhere else it seemed to have been well received. Is that, is that not the case? Yes, it was all right. I mean, uh, w what certainly was the case was that 
um, when it was released here, um, there was a very strong um, uh, 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 extreme feminist reaction to it. Um, an irrational reaction. I mean, the film was described as misogynist. It is not a misogynist film. Uh, it obviously looks uh, in a very blatant way at aspects of the relationships between men and women. Uh, if anybody's a misogynist, Johnny is not a misogynist. I mean, he has, there is behaviour which we, we can talk about and, and in a question way, but the misogynist is obviously Jeremy. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. But again, the, the, that's to do with various complexities and vulnerabilities and uh, insecurities that people have. Um, but obviously, it, it's very it's reductionist to talk about it as a either a misogynist or some people even call it a fascist film, oh, really, which is uh, yeah, which is um, again not exactly. Accurate. It's a bit confusing. I've never heard that one. But of, of course, um, you know, because of the way you work, the um, re remarkable women in the, the film, and it, it's not just um, Leslie Sharp, the, the late Catherine Cartledge, um, Deborah McLaren, who yes. plays the woman in the window, Gina McKee, in what must have been her third film role, I think, as the cafe girl. I mean, they all created those characters. Yeah, they collab. The important thing is they collaborated to make the characters, and oh, thank you. They were all nothing if not feminists. No, exactly. <laughs> ah, yeah, and also I remember that extraordinary scene where, in order to get away from Jeremy, the two women go down to the pub and they talk about abortions and children, and oh, it's powerful stuff, really. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Yes, there's somebody bursting with a question. I can see already. Thanks, Richard. He's in the third row at the end. Thank you. Hi. Is that okay, volume-wise? Hi. Um, I haven't seen the film since 1994, I think. Um, so it's it's almost like watching it for the first time. Um, what You've obviously talked a bit about the ways the film is sort of a departure um, or stands out from everything else that you've done and I haven't seen literally everything but one thing that seems fairly unusual um, is it centering on particularly on one individual lead character versus a sort of more egalitarian approach to the ensemble I mean it is a strong ensemble of characters but it is it is Johnny's film in a lot of ways and I just wondered if um, well, A, that was a conscious decision and if so, to, for it to be a departure and also if it was a conscious decision you made before or during the process of developing the the roles, the characters with the actors. Well, you know, you can't make a piece of art whether you writing or painting or making sculpture or whatever you do without two things happening if it's real organic work you embark on a journey to discover what the thing is but at the same time you have you make decisions and you have notions and you know you conceive things and yeah I mean I, I definitely um, thought about the I've already said you know this film is was was going to in some way to be more picaresque, more about somebody go, going on a journey. So yeah, that was part of the central um, conception. However, that was going to work itself out. I, I always think retrospectively that this film, that the, 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 amongst my films, the, the the sibling to this film is Happy Go Lucky. Because, in a way, uh, it's interesting. I always think to look at Johnny and Poppy uh, alongside each other. Let me just hasten to say that this never occurred to me till after I'd made Happy Go Lucky. <laughs> uh, it wasn't an, a deliberate thing, um, and of course, there's quite a long gap between those two films. But both um, 
films focus on the central character, although Johnny is far more exclusively at the centre of things than Poppy is, though she mostly is. But what's interesting to me about those two characters looked at side by side is that both are idealists. Johnny is an idealist, but is a frustrated idealist, a disappointed, embittered idealist, an idealist whose ideas, whose um, aspirations have turned in on themselves, and uh, there's a, there's a negative things. A Poppy, of course, is a positivist. You know, she deals with it. She, etc. Um, so I think that's I don't know whether that's relevant or interesting, but they are the only two films that have such definite central characters but that's just in the nature of the thing really. you'd you'd worked with Thewlis earlier hadn't you, you yeah yeah he was in yeah no he was uh, this was the third sweet, time I worked with him. he was in a short and curlies and then he was in life is sweet and um uh, just anecdotally in relation to your question um in life is sweet if you saw it he plays um Nicola's boyfriend, who comes round secretly in the daytime um, and licks chocolate off her tits and all that stuff. And um, y- you only see him twice. And, of course, David Thewlis was there and he developed this whole character and all the rest of it. Um, but it was in the nature of the dramatic requirement of the character that he only got to a, a, a briefer appearance than he might otherwise have... Um, that he did expect. And sometime after we'd made that film, I was talking to him and I said, do you you want to do another film? And he said, well, how do I know the same thing won't happen again? So I said, I'll tell you what, I guarantee if you work with me on the next film, you'll get a very good slice of the pie. (laughs) And that, that promise evolved into the decision that is, or it was part of, the thinking that it, that your question is about. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, there's somebody at the back. I can see waving a hand in the darkness. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, you, you have kind of touched upon this a bit, but I'm just curious, sort of, what was the conception of, of the film? Like, what... Did you set out as a rough idea of, you know, a beginning, middle and end of how it would go? Or was it more just you literally did mould it as it went along, you turned up and... Well, I I have already referred to it. And the answer is both of those things. Yeah. You know, I mean, for example, in putting together... Because one of the things I have to do is you can't have all the actors on contract from day one, all of them because there's a lot of individual work and it grows. So what I have to do is to structure when people will join in. Um, and obviously you pair them up when you think, you know. So, and one of the things that I, one of, the, one of those decisions was that Peter White, who plays Brian, the guy in the office block, and Deborah McLaren, who plays the woman through the window, across the road, Somehow I thought, well, that's a, there are, these. This will be a couple. He'll meet a couple somewhere along the line. So it was really when we were investigating, getting into it, that I realised that although they were there in the same time zone, they were not going to be a couple. I mean, they are a couple. It's here's the guy in the office block who spent his time looking at this woman across the road. So in that sense, they are a duo. But she doesn't know that, and you know. But I actually thought they would be perhaps he would run into a married couple or something. But of course, but by the time it came to it, that was irrelevant. That was not what was required, um, and all sorts of other things led to the idea of the the the, the, um, the guy guarding the office block. I just want to say something else about the office block, which is I think interesting, and that is that when we prepared the characters and we did improvisations in another place where we were rehearsing which was an office block um, belonging that had belonged to the inner London Education Authority um, 
my assumption, and indeed that, that of our assumption, was that Brian was guarding a, a working set of offices with desks and computers and machines and stuff. And Alison Chitty, the designer, one day came running in. She said, I've had a great uh, brainwave. What do you think about this? She said, I've found that, she said, what if he was guarding an empty office block, just guarding space? And of course, I thought, well, that's just magic. It's exactly what the film's about. You know, it makes much more sense because she'd found this place in Charlotte Street, which was empty and um, uh, which we used. Um, so those are the kind of things that, you know, and it, again, apart from anything else, that's an illustration, of course, of the collaborative nature of how we make these films. And uh, did Al Al Alison found the house, didn't she? They, uh, late in the day, because we, we'd established the, all the stuff about the, the, the flat that they were in the, you know, and, and, and uh, they kept coming with pictures of, flats in houses and flats in blocks of flats and flat. and I kept saying no it has to have an edge to it it has it, it's not just any bland uh, pad it's got to have the whole it's got to have an edge to it or something and this, I don't know what you mean I said well I, it's hard to see you know all that went on and it was quite late in the day one day they rushed in and they uh, Alison and the um, location manager they said how about this and they'd found and uh, the it's in Dalston you, if you know that area, you'll know the house. It's it's a, this, it's like a Charles Adams <laughs> gothic phantom, you know. And you see it, and apart from anything else, it's you, you can see it from all sorts of different angles and things. And and uh, it was more than perfect. And it you know it fed back into the what you call the poetry of the yeah oh the definitely because yeah. it's like an island, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. You, you look, you're constantly looking up because they're living up there. Yeah. And they're coming down, so it looms yeah. at you. And, it, it's uh, and um, we, as is often the case with these films, um, we shot a great deal of it without knowing how it was going to end. And so the, we, we had got to where we had to shoot the end. And, and um, we had a you know very interesting thing on the go. Does he go back to Manchester with Louise? Does he... You know what? How does he? What does he do? You know how does it resolve? And what does she? What? Why? What? You know. And I would drive there every morning from North London, where I used to live then, um, along this road, seeing the house at the end, um, and not really paying any attention. That was the location. I was more concerned with getting breakfast and um, listening to Radio 3 or 4 and um, not paying attention. And then one day I suddenly spotted it. I suddenly saw the house and I saw the road and I saw him hobbling down the street because obviously we, it, it was, we were dealing with the action where he'd already been beaten up and his foot's... Uh, not functioning properly and um so that the, the 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 place the image of the place suddenly i went back and i said actually i think what happens is he, you know, he said absolutely and he grabs the money and he, he fucks off <laughs> that's how it ends like that so that's thank, a, a yeah, good thank you aspect to your question yes there's a gentleman here thank you we're getting questions from all around the auditorium. This is very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. One of the most remarkable things about the film, I think, is the language, the dialogue, and the soliloquies of the central character. I wonder how much of that was conceived by yourself and how much by David Thewlis. And also, were there any conscious literary or theatrical inspirations behind the language? Because it seems so distinctive to me. Um, to add to the second part of your question first, not really. I mean, we didn't really sort of go, we're not referring to other th things other than where things are quoted. Um, it, but to answer the main thing, it's a combination of both. I mean, I, I, um, I mean this applies to every character and everything, you know. We, we work on the character um, and build it, build the character and the, the idea of the character and the characterization, which is how the actor plays the 
the character, which includes, you know, how the character thinks and we get that on the go and how the character talks and et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, that's true of all the characters in my films. And that's a question of combination, you know, of where they're from and what kind of idioms they would use and what kind, all the rest of that. But here we're also talking about a character who is a motor mouth and who reads and who's got ideas on the go. Plus, um, David Thewlis is a very intelligent guy. So, I mean, you know, you couldn't achieve what... You couldn't achieve the performance of Johnny without the actor also being very intelligent and uh, able to absorb material and stuff and to process that through the character in collaboration with me. So that, for example, uh, the famous bit where he's silhouetted in the office and he's doing that long spiel, um, we spent a very long time working at that, improvising, drawing from different sources of different improvisations that had happened, different ideas that we, you know, I mean, when we were in re the rehearsal stage, um, you know, I would uh, work one stage of the day with this actor and then those actors, and, and David was doing, I think, about four o'clock on the particular day, and he'd been hanging around Soho, and he came and he said, you'll never, I met this young American nutcase in Soho who was on about laser tattoos and, and how in, in the a few decades time there'll be laser tattoos, all that stuff. Well, that just was perfect for, that comes out in that um, long rant, as do all sorts of other things. Um, but then we would work at it and I, you know, I would, my job is to, uh, edit it with him and to organize it and to um, obviously you want to make it flow and work with a piece of writing in its own right and give it its structure and its you know take out the repetitions and and make it appropriately alliterative and all of those things so there's input from me as a writer and him as a writer via the acting and uh that's how it works. And of course, working in that sequence, incidentally, with Peter White playing um, Brian, who is also a highly intelligent and articulate and literate actor, um, we were able to really get discussions and things on the go. Um, you know, it being very much the case that, you know, this can only work with intelligent and articulate actors. Though they're not playing themselves. It's about character. Thank you. Thanks. And have, yes. They do that. Very simple question, but is it... Sorry, is it then, does a script develop and is written and learnt, or do they continue to improvise? No, no, there's no improvisation on screen. It's absolutely... No, absolutely none at all. Uh, and in fact, if you look at that sequence I've just been talking about, there's no, if you, I mean, you're a filmmaker yourself, I mean, you know, although you make documentaries, you know that even when you, well, there's that kind of things that you do, I mean, that... that, that you know when it's something that's that's organic and when it sort of isn't. You couldn't improvise. That, I mean, that's a, that's sustained in one shot. That thing. You couldn't improvise that in a million years. I mean, unless you were. I mean, it's you get fluky things that can be done through improvisation. But I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in something that is distilled and dramatic and organized and you know so no it's and you know we we one of the things that we one of the eccentric things that we did in creating that particular sequence is that i realized that if we rehearsed it if we did the because we the first thing is to go to the location and do improvisations in the location and then build the scene through rehearsal and make it precise, the whole sequence uh, going all around the building. And I realised if we rehearsed it in the day, in the middle of the West End, with all the traffic and the like, uh, we wouldn't really ever get 
the, the, the actual experience. So we went into nighttime mode for several weeks and we rehearsed it for like, I've forgotten that, about eight days or something at nights. And then we shot it at nights and we went into that with that nighttime mode. It was quite uh, spooky actually. Um, but so it, not only are we talking in relation to your, both your questions about what's happening dramatically, what's happening psychologically and emotionally, and about the the, the, the verbal or literary or uh, dramatic aspect of things, but also the spirit of place, because that informs the action. I mean, and, you know, uh, that, that the, the, the inspiration of Alison Chitty of empty space informs the actual um, action itself. Um, if you like, it's the poetry of place as much as it is of, about people. And in, and actually, just finally, another anecdotal thing about that particular sequence is that, uh, which may illustrate how uh, I arrive at decisions, it, it, it is that we, so we set up an improvisation of them going around the building, of that particular section of the building on that floor at night, and I sat in the corner as I did quietly l l letting it happen, seeing what would happen in an improvised situation. And the lights were on behind in the next room, but they were it was dark in the room that I was sitting in, oh, and those windows were there. And they came in, and, and Brian had to go down to the other end of the room to turn the lights on. So before he did, he stopped. And so what happens in the film actually happened naturally. And I, what I experienced, which is very exciting from being that I'm there to make a film, um, is that I, what happens in, the, in that scene actually happened naturally, which is that they were silhouetted against that window with the light in the room behind them. Um, and a, the early version of that rambling came out, which then we were able to arrest and pin down and distill over long, lengthy rehearsals until we had it absolutely precise. But the idea of it, of them being silhouetted in that way that they are, came naturally because that's how it was, in, because of the, the physicality and the dynamics of the rooms in the building. I mean, one of the most haunting uh, shots for me in that um whole sequence is the one of that uh, from Johnny looking from the woman's window to see a ghostly Peter Wright uh, Brian. Beh Brian behind the shutters and you don't he feels like a wraith yeah. he, he doesn't seem to be there at all no uh, in fact however it, it, it is simply what you're looking at is the, the very thing because we were in the room on the other side of Charlotte Street and you are looking at him in that window, you know. Yeah, I mean, but another kind of, as it were, opportunistic shot. Yes, but again, once you're in, the, this is the thing, and I hear, here we're talking about the collaboration with Dick Pope, the cinematographer. I mean, once we're in the mode of, you know, this is the film we're making, this is the style of the thing, this is the, you know, you... You know, anybody here that's a filmmaker or an artist will know what this is. You know, once that's what you're doing, then you start to see it. You know, you start to find it. You're you, fi you find it yeah. everywhere, you know, or, yeah. or where you need it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Wow, very good. Um, yes, gosh, two. They're th thudding out now. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I have a quite detailed question about the character. I wonder why you create the character Sandra as someone who doesn't or can't finish her sentences. Well, um, I, let me begin by saying that I love Sandra. I love it when she comes, shows up. I love it when she gets out of the taxi. Uh, and I, although she walks into this hell that's going on uh, I love the sort of breath of fresh air that she brings um, again I mean when I collaborate with actors um, to create these characters uh, I start off by asking the actor to think of all sorts of real people they know and um, 
Claire Skinner, who plays that character, she actually um, talked about this woman who was very bright and uh, uh, efficient, but couldn't finish sentences. And I just thought, uh, and, and she, she, jo she joined the film uh, a little bit later on for various practical reasons. And so I had the whole thing on the go, the, 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 the sort of motor mouth, uh, art, um, much talking aspect of the film. And I just thought, what a hoot to have this character come in at the end who is bright and knows what's what, but can't quite finish in a door. Um, so in a way, it's, at one level, the the, the 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 justification or the reason why why it felt a good wheeze to have a character who has that characteristic was in in the context of a very much of a talking film, you know, with a great deal of articulate articulation going on. Um, that that's the answer to your question. It's also it's it's quite a. I mean, you wouldn't have thought about this, but it's a kind of formal coup that the end section of the film is led by this, uh, it completely transforms every, the movie. Yes, I, yes, and I think, it's, I think that's very important, and I did yeah. think about it very much so. I mean, and, and the fact that she's, you know, she's been not on this sort of safari, and she's in a, you know, safari kit, and she's, you know, all about order, and the whole place is completely fucked by this nonsense <laughs> that's been going on, and she's it's outrageous. But... At the same time, she's a nurse and she knows how to deal, you know, to clear up. She knows how to deal with his foot, you know, and uh, she won't take any shit from Jeremy Sebastian. And, you know, uh, uh, you know so in a way, that, to, to go back to what you were talking about now and um, the car that aspect of her that you asked about, which is she doesn't finish a sentence. Yeah, she doesn't finish a sentence, but she's not in any way ditzy. I mean, she actually is focused yeah she, to me she brings a daylight into yeah the night absolutely the no no I, 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 and um, that's reflected in the score and in how she as i say in what she's wearing and all that yeah um, uh, I, I, and there's a key line i think it's very important when he says um so did you see any um monkeys or, or you know and she said, and, uh, and, she, and and in amongst that thing she says no i've I, I, you know, I, I went with my wanker boyfriend. You know, and you just get that that her relationship was just ended on top, and so on she really doesn't head. need all the shit that's going on. You know. <laughs> Poor old Sandra. And there was one more question there. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I just I haven't watched this probably since 1994, and it struck me as a very European film. Even though it's you know you 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 start in Manchester, it goes to London, and it seems to be in a sort of at times in these places that are kind of timeless, uh, like you know under the arches and in this kind of strange postmodern yeah. building. It's it, it's got that sort of European sensibility about it, but sort of the, the drifting aspect. Uh, so I just wondered, was that a uh, I mean, did that just sort of come out of the pu out of the kind of? Well, I mean, I I I, I, um, I think I know what you mean when you say European. I mean, I, I, I I'm disposed to always to regard anybody saying that one of my films is European. I, I interpret that as being not Hollywood. <laughs> Definitely not Hollywood. Yeah. No, no, but I mean that's what. That's what that means, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, but but there's nothing consciously. I mean, what is conscious, and we've talked about it, and you refer to it in your question, uh, is that that, that you know that, that there's that, that they're quite abstracted uh, in a way. Here and there, there are some abstracted locations. You know. Uh, uh, um, But um, there's nothing consciously European about it. I mean, it's it's certainly a London film, you know. And some of it's very, very literally on the streets. I mean, the whole section when he um, when he's, he reaches the climax when he leaves the flat, and the music builds to a climax, 
And then when he's in Brewer Street, outside Lena's stores, which is actually still there, there's no music and it's shot very naturally. And we actually shot it, it, it all night. And uh, with no crowd control, and people were just walking past and all of that. Although we structured the actual action between them. Because I, I thought for a second when you see you and Bremner, for a second I just thought, oh, that's just someone who happens to be in shot. <laughs> you know, no, for course. a second. No, and of course that's deliberate. That's absolutely deliberate. It looks like a, a, a you, one of the bystanders. That's but that's that's a deliberate trick. I mean, exactly. And you've spotted it. You know, um, just to, in passing, um, I should tell you that um, we shot it after hours all night, and then we went away. And um, a couple of years later, some guys wrote a book about filming in London and each chapter was a different film. And one of the chapters was about naked. And they went to Lena's stores and they went in and they said, um, how do you feel about naked? And the guy said, what do you mean? Uh, and they said, um, well, that film that was shot on your doorstep and they'd never heard it, they never knew <laughs> because we were there <laughs> that, that night. Now they know. <laughs> um, but at that time they had no idea that they were you know, and, and it's still there, uh, as you know. It's, it, yes, it's expanded into quite a big chain. Now yeah, in there's another couple of branches. Yeah. But you, your question brings up <clears throat> something I did want to mention, which is that, of course, um, it was European enough for you to um, get Best Director at Cannes yeah. and David to get Best, best Actor. Best actor. Yeah. Um, and it puts you on a completely different footing internationally. I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Um, maybe there's something in what the gentleman says. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe that, yes. But but you know, but certainly there's nothing consciously European about it. it. It is what it is, you know. And it's is. I'm nothing. Can't say more about it than that. Thanks. Um, are there any more? Yes, there's one at the back. Thank you. Hi there. I just wondered, uh, you mentioned the pushback the film got. Um, are there any scenes of sexual violence that you'd think you'd do differently now? Or any scenes that you... That I would do differently now? Yeah. Or no. No? No, it is what it... No, I, I, um, it, it is what it is, and it was, came out of where we were. Um, yeah, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't... Um, I mean, you know, it's an important film. For, for, this is a film. Uh, what we made it in nineteen ninety two, so that's um, exactly that number of years ago. So my sons, who are now in their forties, one of whom is a filmmaker, Leo Lee, the other's an illustrator. Um, they were in their sort of. 12, 15 age. And um, it became clear that what sort of a film was being, I'd been making. Um, and up to that time, they really had um, not paid much attention to whatever it was that I was doing. They neither made films, but they were really into, you know, uh, commercial films that lads were into but they weren't really interested in what I was doing and um, it, their mother and the mother of one of their mates because um, we mooted the possibility of them coming to the cast and crew screening and they said well we need we should see it so their mother Alison Stedman and this other friend looked at it and they said no 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 the boys really shouldn't see it it's not appropriate for them and um, there was a bit of a standoff about that you know and very shortly after that I smuggled these various boys into a screening at the London Film School that was going on and they loved it <laughs> they loved it it was and it, it, it was a major experience for them for all sorts of positive and good reasons nothing at all uh negative and 
So to answer your question, this is a rather elliptical answer to your question. For me, it sits very healthily where it is in 1992-3 and where I was and where they were and the influence it had on them and other people and so on and so forth. And I wouldn't, there's no case, there wouldn't be a case for changing it. Um, why? Why would you want to do that? You know, it is what it is and it set, sits where it sits. If I understood your question correctly. No, no, it's just one of those things. I don't know if you've seen it recently or, or you, you think back on it and if anything stood out, because obviously, you know, no, you're I mean, looking through a different the, the, frame. Uh, yeah. on, on another level, on a more technical level, um, if you mean, are there scenes that I would, that I didn't think quite were up to it or, and I don't, there aren't. I mean, I think it's all works you know and um th there's very little in any of my films that i would want to go back and uh check change really T to be honest uh, uh that doesn't sound smug it's just that th the work sits where it sits you know and it is what it is well um i want to oh yes you've got a question yeah, I'm just wondering whether you're can you take the microphone I'm interested to know whether you're asking because you think there is a problem because of the time gap. No, I think you're just... We all, oh, you, right, you do a lot of running now. <laughs> <laughs> Too much necessary. Yeah. No, I think it, there's obviously... Uh, there's the shocking scenes and there's scenes where there's cruel humour used with, you know, physical violence. I think there's, there's always an interesting... Um, you're always going to have different reactions as an audience member, and I just wondered if Mike had a different reaction as a filmmaker. Now it's 30 years old, that's all. Thank you. Um, I shall draw us uh, to a close. Um, I don't know whether any of you are coming back to a very, very different film uh, tomorrow, which is Career Girls. Um, this is an extraordinary period, really, for you. The, the actual order is naked, secrets and lies, Career Girls and Topsy Turvy. And as a quartet of films, they are the most extraordinary, varied collection of stuff. So your your um your sense of wanting to do something different. I think these four films are the four that really stand out to me. Do you have any comment on that? Well, I mean, in a way, I, I um I always try and react against what that which went before uh, at some level. I mean, obviously, um, uh, when it comes to the film which you're going to show on Sunday, which is Topsy Turvy, I mean, I was definitely going out of my way to, to break the mould. <laughs> um, but, but, but um, and of course, to some extent, these films are a function of their, of some practicalities. I mean, the next film, tomorrow's film, Career Girls, is a very much more, much smaller film, and there are very few characters. And that's because there was a much smaller budget, and you cut your cloth according to its length. Um, uh, And that informs your ideas and your... But that's true of all, you know, all sorts of art. Yes, I mean, it's interesting. We can discuss this tomorrow, but in terms of the, that series of films, you would have thought after the international success of Naked, the international success of Secrets and Lies, it isn't an obvious move to go to a small budget film. No, th th those were circumstantial, and I won't bore you with them either. Well, you can bore us tomorrow. tomorrow. Well, no, but, but also, I mean, of course... Um, having reacted against or, or tried to move away from the more domestic t t type of film in making this film, it this film is followed by Secrets and Lies, which of course, though it is in many ways an epic journey in its own right, is nevertheless about... Families yeah. and I, I, so you know I don't know maybe too much can be made of this yeah thing. inevitably um, okay thank you Mike thanks everybody see you thank again you. soon thank you